So today I'm going to talk to you about some studies that we've done looking at the temperature dependency of vapor pressure for three volatile liquids, acetone, hexane, and methanol. So here's a brief outline of where we're headed. So first we'll talk a little bit about what vapor pressure is to make sure that everybody understands that concept. Um, then we'll talk about the methodology behind our particular experiment and how we're going to go about measuring the temperature dependency of vapor pressure for these three liquids. Then we'll show you the results. Then we'll try to explain those results and interpret them from certain perspectives and certain theories, accepted theories and models. And uh, then we'll summarize our conclusions. So to begin, let's take a look at this not uncommon scene. So I don't know how well you can see that, but uh, what we have pictured here, there's a basketball court, uh, there's the hoop there. In the background, we can see some storm clouds, so um, it has just rained, it looks like, and there are even some puddles that are still here on the ground. But what you'll notice that around the margins of the puddles, it looks like it's begun to dry a little bit, and there are even some spots over here that you can't see very well where it's almost uh, completely dry. There's still just a little bit of moisture left there. And so I asked the question, why did this happen? So how is it that the water puddles are going away? And you're going to say, well, duh, that's evaporation. And of course, you'd be right. But it's really kind of funny if you think about it, right? So we've got liquid water down here. Where was it going away to? Is it soaking into the ground? No, it's becoming gas, right? So it's going away because it's becoming gas. So liquid to gas, we call that process vaporization. And that's what happens when you boil liquid. I don't know exactly what temperature it was when this picture was taken but I'm pretty sure it was not 100 degrees Celsius. So um, that's the boiling temperature of water. So how is it that liquid water can go to gaseous water when we're still well below the boiling point? Now that's a much more interesting question. And you have to think a little bit harder to explain that. So here's the commonly accepted understanding for that. And it deals with this concept that we're gonna be talking about, vapor pressure. So let's look at a molecular level model. So here I've got a beaker with some liquid, and uh, the molecules of the liquid are represented here by these little dots, these little spheres. So let's imagine what's going on here. First, there are two things that you need to know. One, well, why is it that these liquid molecules don't simply expand to fill up the space? Why don't they just simply leave the liquid? And the answer to that, point number one, is that these liquid molecules are held tightly together, well, not so tightly, but are held together by what we call intermolecular forces. You could imagine as a metaphor that these guys are covered with Velcro, and so they're held tightly together. And so that's why they don't leave the beaker so easily. The second thing that you need to know is that at a given temperature, the temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the molecules, according to this model. So, we make the temperature warmer, the molecules are going to be moving faster on average. That's an average property. Some molecules will be moving above average speeds, kinetic energies, and some molecules will be moving below average speeds, lower kinetic energies. So let's think about what's going on here. So we've got this uh, closed container right here, and it's empty, evacuated, so a complete vacuum. So what we imagine is that some of these liquid molecules at the surface they might be moving fast enough that they can break free of the intermolecular forces they feel to their neighbors and leap up in here into this space. Now if this were open at the top, which is the case on the basketball court, these molecules might just continue to leave, never to return again to the puddle, the container that's right here. But if this is top is closed, then eventually they're going to start bouncing around in here. And some of them may come back and be traveling downwards slow enough so that they, when they hit the surface here, they're going to stick. Remember that molecules have these intermolecular forces, these attractions that pull them together. So this molecule might stick. And so right now we've got the situation where more molecules are leaving than coming back down. But it might happen that much later we get to this situation where the containers build up with lots of these molecules and they're now coming back and sticking on the surface at the same rate that they're leaving. So we would say that the vaporization rate is equal to the condensation rate. Now at that point, there's no net change in the number of molecules in this container. And so these molecules in the container 
they're bouncing against the walls and they're going to create a pressure. We could attach a pressure gauge to this and measure that pressure of the gas inside there. And that pressure is what we would call the vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is just the pressure that a gas exerts above its liquid. Okay, so that's what vapor pressure is. And again, it's going to depend, according to this model, on two features. The first feature being the intermolecular force strength. So if the force between these molecules is high, it's going to be hard to escape. The second feature is the temperature. So if the temperature is high, the kinetic energy is going to be high, and some of those molecules are going to have enough energy to break free and go into the gas phase. So let's talk a little bit more about intermolecular forces. So there's a lot going on on this slide, and I just want to highlight a couple of important features for you. So up here at the top, we've got intramolecular forces. Now these are what we call chemical bonds. So these are the bonds between atoms in, in compounds. And what I want you to notice is this column right here that's labeled energy in kilojoules per mole, that these are all around 1,000, you know, 4,000, 1,000, but they can get pretty small, I guess, but around 1,000, so pretty big forces. These forces down here list the classes for six types of what we call intermolecular forces. So they're divided into these different types because they tend to have different strengths, and they operate via a different mechanism shown here with this model picture. So I'm going to go through a couple of these that are actually three of them that are important for our uh, discussions later on. So these are ranked in order of strongest intermolecular forces, typically, to weakest intermolecular forces. So we're going to start here at these things called H bonds, hydrogen bonds. So what is a hydrogen bond? Well, to have a hydrogen bond, you need to have an atom A that's highly electronegative. So it needs to be either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine atom. So that atom's going to pull electrons towards itself and get a big partial negative charge. So it's going to pull those electrons away from the hydrogen here, which is going to get a big partial positive charge. That hydrogen then will be attracted to an electronegative atom on another molecule. So these are forces between molecules. And that attraction is what we call a hydrogen bond. And so this electronegative atom also needs to be a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So here's the example between two water molecules. So there are hydrogen bonds between two water molecules here. There's H2O. And this water molecule right here is attracted via a hydrogen bond to this water molecule right here. So this hydrogen, which has a partial positive charge, is attracted to the partial negative charge on that oxygen. So they stick together. Notice that the energies, 10 to 40, are relatively high for this type of bond. Next, we're going to look at dipole-dipole. So what do you have to have to have a dipole-dipole interaction? You have to have a polar molecule. So a molecule that has one end that's a little bit positive and one end that's a little bit negative. So we have to have what are called dipole charges. Notice that these intermolecular forces at 5 to 25 are a little bit weaker than the hydrogen bonding forces. Finally, we're going to go all the way down here to the bottom. These are called dispersion forces or sometimes London forces or London dispersion forces. And they occur between molecules that have polarizable electron clouds. Well, that's all molecules, but molecules that have the characteristic of being nonpolar, they don't have a permanent dipole, this is the only kind of intermolecular interaction that they can do because they've got electron clouds. All molecules have electron clouds. And notice there's a pretty big range here in force strengths, down to a low of 0.05, which is really tiny compared to all of these but up to a strength of about 40, which is the top end of the hydrogen bond forces. So, those three forces I want you to keep in mind. H bonds, dipole-dipole, and dispersion. Hydrogen bonds are typically stronger, dipole-dipole next, and dispersion forces last. Alright, so that's the intermolecular force picture of vapor pressure. So what are we about in this experiment? So in this experiment, we're interested in looking at measuring the vapor pressure of three different volatile liquids. So volatile liquid just means it evaporates easily, it converts into a gas easily. We're going to look at acetone, hexane, and methanol. And we want to measure that vapor pressure as a function of temperature. So I told you that temperature we think is an important parameter. So how exactly does the vapor pressure change as we change the temperature for these three liquids? And second, we want to show that any patterns that we might uncover experimentally can be explained on the basis of this model that I've just shown you. So in terms of molecular level models, the kinetic molecular theory, 
and of intermolecular force strength. So we will be looking at those things. So how do we go about doing that? Well, basically we want to recreate that picture that I showed you with the gases escaping into that empty vessel. Um, the vessel that we're going to be using is a 125 milliliter sidearm suction flask with a tight fitting cork. Set into that cork, we've got a little connection that we can use to attach a pressure gauge via a hose and a thermometer that is going to be in the gas space up here. Before we stick the stopper in, we're going to add about 15 milliliters of the liquid that we want to test to the bottom of this flask. That volume is not too crucial. We just need to have enough to evaporate so that we don't evaporate at all into our flask. And then we'll connect it like shown. Um, right here we've got a stop cock, a valve that we can open and close, and then it connects to a vacuum source over here. So we're going to put our li liquid in here in the bottom of our flask, tightly fit our stopper in here, make sure there are no leaks that it's good and gas tight, connect to our pressure gauge, and then we're going to immerse that in a flask of warm water, a beaker of warm water. So we've got a beaker of warm water here. So then what's going to happen is this liquid is going to start to evaporate. So inside this empty space up here, we're going to have some molecules of the liquid that have begun to evaporate, as well as the air that was trapped in that flask initially. Now we want to get the air out, so our procedure was to open the stopcock. The pressure difference then is going to cause this air to get pushed this way toward the area of lower pressure over here at the vacuum pump. And so we're going to take some of these evaporated molecules in the air, and we're going to pump them that way. Then we're going to close the valve, let the system re-equilibrate, and do that three times just to make sure we've gotten most of the air that was initially trapped in there out. Then we're going to watch our thermometer and uh, our pressure gauge and when the thermometer stabilizes we're going to assume that we are at thermal equilibrium. So the temperature of the gas, the liquid, and the water, the beaker of water would all be the same and they're measured by this thermometer. So then we can record temperature and pressure and then we're going to add ice to our flask to cool the temperature down. Once the ice melts and the temperature appears to stabilize, we're going to assume we're at thermal equilibrium and take another pressure reading. And we'll just keep doing that until we've uh, gotten several points. So that will give us a way of measuring the pressure inside this flask as we change the temperature of the system here. So that's our procedure. And here are the results then. So uh, this is pressure on the y-axis, vapor pressure increasing, and this is temperature in degrees Celsius increasing as we go left to right. So here are the results. Acetone is shown in red. Um, here in green we've got methanol, and hexane is shown in blue. So our results indicate that as temperature increases, vapor pressure goes up for all three of these volatile liquids, but not in the same way. These curves are not on top of each other, and they have different slopes. Now it appears for all three of these curves that they can fit a linear trend, so we fit a linear equation to each one of these curves, each one of these data sets here, and in particular you can look at the R squared value, and uh, since they're very close to one in each case, our data is pretty linear. If you actually get close, however, and particularly look at this green curve for methanol and the blue curve for hexane, you'll see that the line, the best fit line right here, kind of uh, runs through these points, and these points right here in the middle seem to lie below the curve. These points at the end seem to lie above the curve, so it actually looks like the curve bows a little bit. So it might be that if we had gotten more data points, we would see some curvature in this data, but it's not entirely clear from the data set that we have. So notice that the slopes are different for acetone in particular. The slopes of uh, methanol and hexane, 6.3 and 6.1, are pretty close to each other. What is different, however, is that methanol's curve lies on top of the hexane curve by a little bit, and the acetone curve is much higher. So at any given temperature, the vapor pressure of acetone is much higher than that of methanol or hexane. That implies that, meth that acetone is more volatile, so it's easier for that uh, substance to vaporize than the other two. So we would say that hexane then is the least volatile, the least easy to vaporize, since it has the lowest vapor pressure. So now we want to explain some of these trends. So first we're going to look at the trend uh, as we increase temperature that pressure increases. And then we're going to go back and see if we can explain why it is that the acetone curve is higher 
than the methanol curve, which is then higher than the hexane curve. So we want to explain those two features. So the first feature. Well, we're going to make use of this kinetic molecular theory. Again, it says that as temperature increases, so does the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So as your molecules in the liquid have more kinetic energy, they're going to be moving around faster, and there's a greater chance that they can escape and become gas. So here we have some ethanol at, um, in an ice bath at zero degrees, and not very many of these molecules have enough kinetic energy to escape, to break free of the intermolecular forces and go into the vapor phase. And so they don't push down on this column of mercury to make a very big change, so the vapor pressure is low. Now here at room temperature, at 20 degrees, many more of those molecules will have enough kinetic energy to break free of the liquid and become gas. And so we have more gas particles here. They're going to push down on this column of mercury with a greater pressure, and so we get a greater vapor pressure. So this is exactly what we saw, that as we increase the temperature, more kinetic energy means more gas molecules and a greater pressure. So this theory, at least, agrees with our data very well. Now let's look at intermolecular forces. So I have representations here, ball and stick models, of the three molecules that we were looking at. So here at the top is methanol. So uh, methanol is uh, this shape with the carbon here, and oxygen here, and a hydrogen here. So this is one methanol molecule, and here's another methanol molecule next to it. And I drew that one here just so that you could see that there's a hydrogen bond here. So remember our pattern for a hydrogen bond? An electronegative atom like an oxygen, it's bonded to a hydrogen, and then that can form a hydrogen bond to a neighbor. So methanol is a polar molecule because this electronegative oxygen has a high electronegativity to it, and that's going to pull electron density towards itself. So it's a polar molecule, and it can form hydrogen bonds. And remember, hydrogen bonds were typically the strongest of the intermolecular forces that we looked at. Next is acetone, so it's made up of three carbon atoms. And in the middle carbon atom, it's double bonded to an oxygen atom right here. And what we know about oxygen atoms is they're highly electronegative, so they pull electron density away from their neighbors. And so this end of the molecule is going to get a negative charge, and this end of the molecule will be partially positively charged. So this molecule is polar. So remember, if you have a polar molecule, that it can interact through dipole-dipole interactions. So acetone cannot hydrogen bond, but it can do dipole-dipole interactions. Finally, hexane is all carbon and hydrogen. And typically a molecule that's just carbon and hydrogen, a hydrocarbon, will be nonpolar. So this is a nonpolar molecule. And the only kind of intermolecular force that it can have are these dispersion interactions, these London dispersion forces, which are the weakest. So I've drawn them on this slide to indicate the relative strengths. So we would predict that the methanol molecules have the strongest intermolecular forces, so it would be hardest for the methanol molecules to escape into the vapor phase. Next, the acetone molecules have dipole-dipole interactions, so those would escape more easily than methanol. Finally, the hexanes would escape most easily of all because of the dispersion interactions. But of course, that's not what we saw. In fact, we saw that acetone was the most volatile, so easiest to vaporize. Then next was methanol. Finally, hexane, which we would have expected would have the weakest forces, was the hardest to vaporize. Let me just go back and show you that. So remember, acetone has the highest vapor pressure. That means that more of these molecules are getting free of the liquid than compared to hexane down here, this blue curve. So how do we explain that? This is what we predicted based on that table of intermolecular force strengths. Well, let's look at some other data. So I pulled some other data here for these three liquids. So um, here in this column, I've looked up the boiling points. So that's how much thermal energy you'd have to put in to boil these liquids. The temperature is a measure of that. And this actually agrees with the data that we got. So acetone has a boiling point of 56, which is the lowest of the three. Methanol is 65, and hexane is 68. So it looks like it's easiest to vaporize acetone. Lower temperature is needed then methanol is next, and hexane is the hardest to vaporize with a boiling point of 68 degrees C. Next I have dipole moments in units of devise. So this is measuring how polar the molecule is. And typically the things that have more polar molecules will have stronger intermolecular forces. So acetone has a 2.69 divide, which is really pretty close to methanol, which is 2.87, a little bit higher. So we predict then based on polarity that methanol has a 
higher intermolecular force strength than this does. Hexane, we said, was nonpolar. In fact, it has a very tiny dipole moment of 0.08 devise. So it's essentially nonpolar. So where we really see differences, though, are looking at these last three, the number of atoms, the number of valence electrons, and the molar mass. So what you can see from this data is that both acetone and methanol are small molecules. They have small numbers of atoms, a small number of electrons, and relatively small um, masses, molar masses. Whereas hexane is a larger molecule, many atoms, 20 atoms compared to 10 and 6, 38 electrons. They've got a lot of electrons in their electron cloud to push around, and their molar mass is consequently much heavier. So it is because of these features that they have so much more mass and so many more electrons, and the molecule is long and spread out. We'll go back to that picture right here. So it's a long sort of sausage-shaped molecule that this molecule then can have only dispersion interactions, but those dispersion interactions are going to be particularly strong because the molecule is long, it's big with many atoms, and has many electrons. And so we expect that, that as molecules get bigger, their dispersion interactions are stronger. So that's why in this case, hexane has a so much lower vapor pressure as a function of temperature than our other two liquids, simply because it's much bigger. So our trends might have worked out correctly if we had looked at molecules that were all roughly the same size. But hexane is much bigger. So we say that this then agrees with our prediction for intermolecular forces. So hexane should have stronger intermolecular forces. Why? Because it's a bigger molecule. So finally, let's look at some errors that could have happened in our experiment. First, leaks were a big problem. So it's very difficult to seal that system so that as the pressure is lower inside, that outside air does not leak in. So if that happens, what will occur? Well, the pressure inside the flask will gradually increase over time. So we're cooling it down, so the vapor pressure is going down, but it's not going down as much as it should, perhaps, because molecules from the outside are leaking in. So we're not getting rid of as many molecules as we should, so the pressure is going to stay a bit higher than it should. So that's why I say that what we would then see if this were really happening and it were a problem is that our observed pressures would be higher than they should have been if we had a perfectly sealed system. So on my graph, those pressures might have been particularly at the low temperature end, which for us was after a long time of running the experiment. Well, those pressures might have been lower than they should have been. But we still assume that we would see the same trend, that as temperature goes down, vapor pressure goes down, and the same order, that acetone would be at the top, then methanol, then hexane. So they might be leaking at approximately the same rate, and that wouldn't affect the results in that way. So in fact, if we estimate that there was about 3.5 millimeters of mercury per minute pressure change at worst, and that's based on when we did a leak check at the beginning by having a vacuum in our sealed flask, this is about how much we were leaking in at that time. And I say it worse because when you have vacuum and atmospheric pressure out here, that's when you're going to get the most leaking in of your sample. So for acetone then, this would result in a slope that's about 15% lower. So in fact, the pressure should have gone down more, so it should have been about 15% steeper than it might have been if um, leaks were at the worst case scenario. The other issue that might have caused problems is not pumping out all that air initially. Remember we capped the flask with the vapor in it and then we pumped out the vapor and the air. Well, if we hadn't removed some of the air, then the air would have increased the pressure at all temperatures. So um, it would not be converting into a liquid, so that gas would simply stay there. So the total pressure would be the vapor pressure of the liquid, which we say is going down with temperature because it's condensing, and the pressure of the air, which would have been a constant. So that, what that would have done is shifted the curves higher on my graph, changed the intercept effectively, but the slopes would have been the same. So we would have had the same slopes, the same trends, and the same order. And so really what's important is the trend and the ordering, because the order tells us about intermolecular forces, that acetone has the weakest intermolecular forces, methanol has the next strongest intermolecular, uh, next weakest intermolecular forces, and hexane had the strongest intermolecular forces. So, our conclusions then. What did we set out to do to measure the vapor pressure of these three volatile liquids as a function of temperature? 
which we did. And then we wanted to show that the patterns that we observed, anything that we observed, could be explained by use of molecular level theories, the kinetic molecular theory, and thinking about intermolecular forces, IMFs. So what were our key results? Well, we discovered that vapor pressure increases as temperature increases. And that agrees with kinetic molecular theory. And second, we observed that intermolecular force strength increases in this order. Acetone has the weakest intermolecular forces, then methanol, then hexane with the strongest intermolecular forces. We looked at a couple of potential errors, and we determined that those errors might affect the slope or the intercept on our graph, but not this trend, number one, or this, conclusion number two, the ordering. So finally, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank Patty Hale for helping me get this data together and for um, Andy Stice for helping me with the video setup and lending me his tripod. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. At this time, I'll answer any questions that you might have.